Go ahead and get started. Is this mic sufficiently live? No. Is that the switch on it? Yep. Is it up? Yep. All right. Uh, <laughs> but, but this is, are we still using that part of this? All right. So um, uh, thanks, everybody, for showing up. It's my um, honor to introduce you to Andy Chang, uh, whom I have known from my graduate school days, back when we both studied Jupiter and Io. Yeah. Um, and have both moved on to different things. Andy got his um, undergraduate degree from Princeton, his PhD from Columbia, this all back, shall we just say, in the second millennium. Yeah, back in the... Um, and then he went, uh, uh, his uh, thesis was in pulsars and neutron stars, and yes. he started teaching in this subject um, at Rutgers, um, uh, and was snatched away to do planetary science at the Applied Physics Lab of the Johns Hopkins University, where he has been working ever since in various roles. Um, and he uh, uh, is the director for space science. But my favorite title um, uh, is the director um, for planetary protection. And I just want to I just want to know, how do you sleep at night if, uh, if you know that that's strange that... powers like that? <laughs> All right, so uh, we should uh, uh, get on with Andy Stark, so please give him a welcome, and we'll turn it over to you. All right, All right so, okay, talk about the DART mission, DART is double asteroid redirection test, and as it says there, it was the first planetary defense test mission, so as my granddaughter says, we bonked an asteroid. Why did we do that? We bonked an asteroid to change its orbit, to show that we could change an orbit, and then also to measure how much we change the orbit and to understand why that happened. So all those things. Okay, now let's see if this works. This is a movie. Do I have to do anything? Maybe. And do I hear sound? No, I don't hear sound. Let's see, do I have to turn sound on? I have to turn sound on. Anyway, you hear people from NASA headquarters saying profound things. <laughs> there it is, sound. We're embarking on a new era of humankind. Yes, we recognize that voice, some of us. It's Lori Garber. Didymos and Dimorphos make a great target. We needed an asteroid balloon that you can see from ground-based telescopes around the world. We're doing this mission to prove that we can deflect an asteroid. Five, four, three, two, one. Launch on Falcon 9, SpaceX. And liftoff of Falcon 9 and DART on NASA's first planetary defense test to intentionally crash into an asteroid. Even if we do everything right, our sensors work well, our spacecraft is doing well, even then, we might still miss. Four, three, two, one. She was our uh, lead mission engineer. That's the headquarters. He was an asset administrator. Using the ground based telescopes around the world to watch the system and see how it's affected by this impact event. This is a watershed moment for planetary defense and a watershed moment for humanity. Okay, so NASA made that. <laughs> okay, so what did we do? We launched, we saw the launch, it was in 2021, very short mission, and hit the moon of a binary asteroid. So you're targeting the binary asteroid Didymos. So this is Didymos, and this is the moon, this is Dimorphos. We hit the moon, and we changed the orbit of the moon around it's satellite. Now you're asking, did we change the orbit of the system around the sun also? Yes, of course we did, but okay. <laughs> no, it only changed a tiny bit. And um, it's, it's in an orbit that 
doesn't come anywhere close to hitting Earth anyway. So the amount we change it is, uh, is, is less, in fact, than the uncertainty in the orbit that <laughs> with which, or the heliocentric orbit anyway. Okay, so the DART spacecraft here carried a Italian CubeSat, which was contributed by the Italian Space Agency, that's ASI. And we released them a couple weeks before the impact and they flew by and they took pictures. You saw some of the pictures in the movie. I'll show you some more. Okay, so let's go. Ah, yes. So these are near Earth asteroids that we went to and you see our target there, which is Dimorphos. It's just scale with some objects from Earth. So as you can see, we're not as high as the biggest skyscraper on Earth. Although it's bigger than the Eiffel Tower. And this is the actual target. It's 150 meters across average. And that makes it, you know, twice the size of the Statue of Liberty, smaller than one of the Great Pyramids, you know, half the Eiffel Tower. So. <laughs> but um, the impact of such an object, if it hit the Earth, the smaller, you know, 150 meter, it's, it, it would cause a, a regional. It would destroy an area the size of a small state, well, a large metropolitan area, so completely destroy. So it causes, I don't know how many billions of dollars of damage, but anyway, a huge amount of damage enough that if, it were, if we were ever to discover such a threat, we would seriously think, hey, you know, it's probably worthwhile to spend even a few billion dollars to try to stop it from happening. <laughs> okay, all right. So 150, okay. That's 150 meters. Okay, and the advantage of hitting a binary asteroid. So that was that's where I came in. I was I came up with the idea for this mission in 2011. I was in my basement. It was in the morning. I do you know exercises and stretching in the morning, and realized that hey, you know we should do this if we're going to try to do a demonstration of kinetic impactor mission. Kinetic impactor is where you just go and go splat against an asteroid to change its orbit. If you're going to do that, we should do it at a binary asteroid. And the reason is that you change the moon, moon's orbit, it's a lot easier to measure because the moon is only moving at tens of centimeters per second. We're going to change its velocity by millimeter per second. Millimeter per second out of 10 centimeters per second is relatively easy to measure. The heliocentric orbit, 20, 30 kilometers per second, millimeter per second change is not so easy to measure. So that's one of the things, a detectable deflection, asteroid at relevant size, yes. So we, the target of a mission, 150 meters, yeah, that's actually the most likely size of it. Of the, it's the characteristic size of the asteroids that actually give you an impact threat. Now, yes, sir, people talk about what happens if a kilometer size or even a hundred kilometer size asteroid were to hit the Earth, but those are really, really rare encounters. The, the asteroid hit that's caused the demise of the dinosaurs, that was a 10 or 20 kilometer asteroid. That's a 200 million year event. So it's not very likely that we would see one of those in the immediate future. Whereas 150 meter asteroids, they hit much more often. And there you're talking about a you know um, 20,000 year event. Okay, so still you might argue we're not going to see it before the next election or anything like that. <laughs> but um, all right. Anyway. The, 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 the peak of the threat is in the 100 to 200 meter size impactors. That's the size of the impact of the dart hit, of the target that dart went after. Okay, so here's some numbers of kinetic impactor. When we hit the moon, let's see if I can go back. Yes, when we hit the moon, we hit dart, dart hit the moon going head on. So the moon's, as you can see by following the white arrows coming around, in the counterclockwise direction, dart hits it head on. When we hit it head on, we instantaneously slow down the velocity. So you instantaneously reduce it by a millimeter per second or something like that. And the result of that is 
See, the dart is held, I mean, the moon is held up in its orbit by a centrifugal force. So when you slow it down, the centrifugal force is reduced, and so it falls closer to the asteroid. That's what the blue line indicates. That's a new orbit after the moon. If you fall closer to the asteroid, to the main, to the main asteroid Didymos, when you're going closer and you fall in, it's, it's like a skater turning, pulling in your arms. You have to conserve your angular momentum. So you have to speed up. So when you speed up, and then when you, of course, when you come back out again, follow the orbit around. When you come back out again, you slow down again. But you have to speed up when you go closer. And it turns out you speed up more than you slow down. And so the net result of the dart impact is to reduce the orbit period. This is very puzzling to people. How do you <laughs> make it go around faster Reduce the orbit period when you hit it head on. But that's what happens. And this is this is just how the Keplerian orbit or the orbit dynamics work out. It's because when you slow down, you fall closer to the gravitating body, and then you have to speed up to conserve your angular momentum. Okay, so we saw the asteroid for the first time two months out, which is amazing. Camera worked very nicely. I won't talk too much more about that. Okay, now DART had to autonomously navigate. We, didn't, we, we couldn't actually steer it in to hit the asteroid. We had to let the spacecraft steer itself. Although it was only in the last hour or so, as, you show, as it shows here, that the spacecraft started guiding itself four hours out. The, the spacecraft was first able to see Dimorphos as separate from the other from Didymos about more than a little more than one hour out. That's when they first resolved the two targets. Until then, you're targeting Didymos because they only see one blot for the whole system. Two and a half minutes out, the, um, we, we, we told the spacecraft to stop maneuvering. And then at that point, the just to make sure that the spacecraft could continue to image get the best images, get images like this. So the maneuver, the maneuvering ended two and a half minutes out. And this is the last picture. I'll show you it again. All right. And this I think is a movie. Is it a movie? Final raw images. This all right, this is the movie. Here's the movie. So spacecraft is autonomously targeting. This is the time in minutes and seconds before impact. Spacecraft is autonomously pointing itself. So it's already decided it's, it's trying to keep the camera centered on target, Dimorphos. Oh, and now getting bigger and bigger. Oh, we're seeing boulders for the first time. Here it comes, here it comes. Ah. Boom. <laughs> that was the last few images. Once a second, they came in once a second. That's the last partial image, yes. Ouch, yes. All right. And this is a composite of the two. So you have Dynamos and Dimorphos. This is, these are at the same time. So that's what it looked like. We had a camera that was, the resolution of the camera is one arc second. So it was an eight inch camera, diffraction limited or close to it. One arc second imager. That's what, that's what it looks like. Just, you get, Resolved images only in the last hour. <laughs> and then nice images only in the last, you know, 10 or 20 seconds. It's unbelievable. <laughs> but that's because it starts coming in pretty fast. It's coming in at six and a half kilometers per second. Okay. So this is what it looked like 11 seconds before. I call this the fish. Once I call it the fish, you cannot unsee the fish. <laughs> um, and so the sun is still left here. What you see here is there's a terminator, and you see a big rock here. We didn't name that rock, um, but the, the asteroid, the dark side limb, actually goes out to where I'm putting the cursor. We're actually able to see that if you stretch the image enough, you can see where the limb is. It's lit up by reflected light from Didymos. Didymos is to the right in this image, and so this is a big boulder, maybe the biggest one we've seen. It's large enough that it sticks out into the sunlight from the night side. 
That's why it looks like this. So you see the fish, fish tail. All right. Okay, now this is the uh, final region we're, we're going to hit down in here. We hit between these two boulders. They're, they have names. I'll show you the names in a moment. Actually, this guy also has a name. Um, all of those probably don't exist anymore. So it's, it, there's normally a rule that objects that are ephemeral are not allowed to be named. IAU has a rule like this. We, did, we proposed names and just and say that we didn't think they existed anymore. But, so anyway, they, had, they, 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 they are official names, they were approved. Um, I think that's appropriate because people are gonna be looking at DART data and working on it. And these features certainly existed then and they will always exist, at least for the next sec, you know, for one second after this, maybe they existed. <laughs> okay, so this is where the, this is a drawing showing where the spacecraft hit and you also to show basically how large the solar panels are. Solar panels look ridiculously big in this image, and they are. And the reason is that this DART had a uh, solar electric propulsion experiment. So we carried a Next C engine. We were supposed to demonstrate it. And we started to, but um, the, there was a problem on the spacecraft. We had to stop the, the experiment. <clears throat> so it was only operated for about two hours. It did perform during the two hours. The next C engine did perform as expected, but um, it caused a uh, it caused large electric discharges to go into the spacecraft bus and create problems elsewhere in the spacecraft. So we had to shut it down. <clears throat> That's why we have these huge solar panels. Obviously, if it were not for solar electric propulsion, you would have much smaller panels. But uh, having them that big meant that that's why I think that probably both of these boulders are destroyed. There's a chance this guy is still there, but I don't know. Okay, so um, just for some numbers, it says here, this, both of these boulders are six and a half, six point something meters. So that's about the scale. I think it's eight meters from end to end on each solar panel. And the DART spacecraft box is about, this box is about two meters on the side. It's a 600, just under 600 kilogram mass. It's six and a half kilometers per second coming in. So these are the approved names of this boulder. There's a little boulder here, which is the um, reference point, the zero point of longitude system. We have to name that. And then the three boulders of the impact site. We didn't name any of these others. Um, no, it just didn't. And then we have proposed names for a number of craters. I should have shown, maybe I should have showed you. But it's hard to see craters on this thing. That's an interesting thing. We can talk about, that's actually a whole separate colloquium subject. Is what happens when you try to crater an object that's covered with boulders like this? But we have identified some craters. There's a shape model. There's, um, so there are actual depressions that can be, uh, depressions with raised rims there's about half a dozen of them that are quite clear on this but not 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 from this pic from the picture so never mind <laughs> okay these this is one of the images from the italian cube set and here is the morphos and it's badly saturated and this is the ejecta plume so you spacecraft hit um the morphos create a lot of ejecta and and this image was enough to saturate the camera. Okay, so I'll show you some that are not saturated. Okay, so this is actually from about the same time here, three minutes after the impact, after the impact, here's the ejecta plume. And this is the morphos, part of it here. Okay, here's, an, okay, I mean, actually, let me, and so this is before closest approach, after closest approach, you could see the plume now is facing, here the plume is facing toward the camera. So the, the, the ejector, when you hit the moon, it creates an ejector cone or ejector curtain. It's a, it's, it's a cone, it's like a paper cone, if you can imagine a paper cone coming out at you like this. And this cone is actually coming out at you like this. And the after closest approach, the geometry is turned around. So the cone is now facing away from you. And 
metamorphosis in front, and there's this very peculiar shadow here. This peculiar shadow is caused by plume material. So the plume material is optically thick and it's thick enough to cast a shadow on itself. So you can see here's the sun here, this is Didymos. And you can see that the plume is as bright as Didymos. It's also here, the plume is as bright as the comparably lit areas in Didymos. So the plume is optically thick. There's a lot of stuff there. Okay, and this is ground-based observations of the dart impact. There it is. And you can see this is only a few seconds after the, um, there was a fast plume. This is going to repeat. So a fast plume was observed. That material is moving at two or three kilometers per second. So that's not the eject that we just saw from the Italian cubes. It's completely separate. And there's also a report from a ground-based observer that they, they, they measured the sodium lines. This is your, our lovely thing, the sodium line. Let's see how this thing. So that's peculiar, but it's only a very small amount of material. I think it could be only hundreds of kilograms. Um, the total amount of ejecta is probably on the order of 10 million kilograms. So this is very, but you know, sodium is so easy to see. I mean, it's so bright. It doesn't take much material to light up like that. So there's still some question. There was only one, only one observer that thought to try to measure line emission from this thing. No one would have expected it. They saw it. So now we're all thinking, damn, <laughs> is it really line emission or not? <laughs> um, you know, maybe. Okay, so telescopic observers from all around the world. So these are some of the telescopes, but they included Hubble and James Webb as well. These are ground-based observers. Every continent, even Antarctica. Okay, so Hubble image and the Webb image. Um, you, you can see the diffraction spikes. So the one, the, the, those are the diffraction spikes for Hubble and then also the star-shaped diffraction spike from JW. So you, but all the other features there are um, ejective streamers. And this is measured yeah, five hours after the impact and 12 days after the impact. Some more features, a double tail going away from the sun is always to the, to the uh, left. So dust tail, look double for a while. And these streamer fronts, they came down, you can watch this, this particular streamer front moves tailward and then collapses down into the tail again. So we turned uh, Didymos into an active asteroid. There's other active asteroids that have been observed. These are asteroids, they're in the main belt, but they look like comets. And there's already been um, suggestions that these, some of the active asteroids were the result of collisions in the main belt. Something hit it, blew up a dust tail, looks like a comet. There's also um, ideas that some of these active asteroids are caused by, by um, explosive, uh, um, release of water vapor. But um, anyway, we've Dart has demonstrated that you can also make something that looks just like an active asteroid with an impact. Okay, so let's go on. Ah, come on. Ooh. Okay, so this is what it looked like 80 days, 83 days after the impact, and 168 days. Okay, now most of a year after the impact in Hubble. So it's, it's still observable, <laughs> like today, still observable. It's getting, it's, it's getting faint. It's, 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 a, it's something that you wouldn't be able to do with a small telescope anymore, but it's still, it's still observable. Okay, one of the important things we wanted to measure, of course, was the um, measure of how much momentum you transfer. So Dart came in with a certain amount of momentum and how much momentum did we transfer to the target? Well, it turns out that you transmitted to the target at least double uh, or more than what, that's what this factor beta is. It's the multiple, it's the factor, how much greater the momentum transfer was than the incident momentum but both of those projected into the, a particular direction, which is the direction of the ejector cone. So that number is probably a number like four, because our latest values, we have the density. This is beta 
this momentum transfer efficiency factor versus density of the system. We, the biggest thing we did not measure, we did not measure on DARS, was the mass of the morphos. What we did measure, what we know, is the total mass of the system. This is typical for binaries. Astronomers are very familiar with this. We know the total mass of the system. We don't know how the mass is proportioned between the primary and the secondary. So we have this tremendous range of uncertainty here as to what the mass of the secondary is. We parameterize it by density. But you see these numbers are ranging between about two and five. So that means even at the lowest possible densities for the satellite, we transmitted more momentum to the target than was incident from the spacecraft. And more likely, the number of beta is, is, is around four. So that's, that's where we are. OK, so momentum transfer was more than two times. Yes, so that was very, it worked very well. In other words, we were able to change the orbit of the moon. Um, also, as I mentioned, you're going to change the orbit of the entire system. And one of the things that's very exciting that's coming up in the future is that since the knowledge of the ephemeris of the system has improved so much that it's now been possible to do stellar occultations with the Didymo system. So those, <laughs> there's plans to do more of those. And the hope is, actually the expectation is that they'll be able to also measure the heliocentric deflection. So that will be, that will be coming in the next, I don't know, several years. All right. So, the implication for planetary defense is that, that the momentum transfer efficiency is so high. What it means is that you can deflect a larger target with the same impactor, hitting it at the same number of years before you need to miss the Earth. Or you can wait till you get closer before you try to do it. <laughs> okay, so that's good. All right, never mind. Yeah, so then the HERA mission issue. The HERA mission will solve this problem of what was the mass of Dimorphos, because they will go there, they will measure it. So they will put another satellite, rendezvous with the system, and measure the mass of Dimorphos. Okay, so um, that's all I had for today. I have some more material. Yeah. Try to. Have, um, you know, backup slides or other cool I things, I'd say, I'd say go ahead and do some of those, and then we'll have uh, ample time for questions. Um, and Andy, we have a good tradition in our department where we encourage uh, first the students to ask the questions. Okay, I'm sure, sure. They're thinking about those now. Um, and we have both undergraduates and graduate students in the room. All right. Um, I don't have my backup slides in any particular order. <laughs> I can show you some pictures, though. So, so, so these are, this is this is DART in the big thermal vacuum chamber. And you see how big the person is. This is a spacecraft body. Solar panels have been removed because they don't, they would not fit inside. Um, okay. Here's how big the solar panels are. They're very, very, very large. They require a special facility, just like the boom you have hanging up in, in one of your other buildings, big, your big magnetometer boom, whatever. It has to be suspended in the gravity release because it can't support it. You can't just hold on one end of it. It can't support its own weight. The same is true for these solar panels. It could not, you cannot deploy them in Earth's gravity. So they had a special facility to uh, be able to actually deploy, test to deploy the um, arrays. Unfortunately, as you can see here, they're not able, they're not able to do a deployment in vacuum. And so that was a big issue for us. <laughs> do we need them to do that or not? Well, we did not. Okay, all right, it worked. <clears throat> all right. And that's the Litchi Cube, CubeSat. It's in that little box. That is it with the solar panels folded in. So that's the Italian CubeSat with the holder there. And it. That's a picture of our launch. Okay. <laughs> 
All right. Uh, let me encourage you to put some of your other slides up and uh, say what you might know about the physics of a couple of points. I think this recoil factor is not something that people have thought about uh, in advance and the idea that you put a certain amount of momentum in and somehow you get four times the, uh, the recoil back. Right. If you could fold that in with the idea that this is a rubble pile and whether or not you need a rubble pile to get this. I think the physics of the recoil would be of interest to this group. Oh, it's a, it's, it's a big question. A lot of research going on in that area. Yes, so I don't have the slides, but here's what, here's what happens. When, when we come in and we hit the target, it don't, it's not just the bullet comes in, hits the target, and they go off together. Because then your, your beta factor would be one. You just a minimum of after is the same as the momentum before. But what happens is the bullet comes in and it blows the material out the back. So you're throwing material out the back. And that is what increases the momentum. So it's the, the recoil force from ejecting the material after the impact, that recoil force is what gives you the extra transfer of momentum to the target. Those of you who are shooters probably have seen this. That if you shoot a pumpkin, and you no, no, seriously, you shoot a pumpkin, a lot of the bullets will expand inside the pumpkin and they'll make a much bigger hole, they'll throw more material out the back than they do out the front. And when that happens, you shoot a pumpkin and it goes this way after you shoot it. That's the recoil for it. In fact, you've probably experienced it if you've done that. If you ever fired a high speed rifle bullet into a watermelon or a pumpkin, you've seen that. Hit it like this, it goes that way. You sound pretty experienced in this area. I've never done it. I've, I've seen YouTube videos, but I've never done it. This also is but the um, this is also an, an issue, you know, with the Kennedy assassination. Because his head went forward, it went in the opposite. Because one of the one of the rifle hits seemed to make the head go in the wrong direction, and they said, "Oh, that means it was a shooter on the other side." Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Unfortunately, but not necessarily. Um, and is this related to the rubble pile model? Uh, would it would we get that same recoil factor from a more solid, a more consolidated object? It's a, it, it, okay, the question of in, of how that effect is uh, affected by the nature of the target material is really very complicated, as you can imagine. So yes, it still happens with a rubble pile. But what things that matter more are uh, the strength of the target um, and also the amount of internal friction. And if you have a porous target, um, something called a crush, when you crush it, collapse, how much force does it take to collapse the pore, pore space in the body? And then how much does the strength increase once you've done that? So it's something called a crush curve. So all those things matter to affect and determine the amount of this this beta so what we have what we are finding at least some of us is that dimorphos has to be a very weak target but maybe not as weak as some of the astro other asteroids that have been visited so we have the sample returns that just came back from Bennu and <clears throat> the Osiris Rex sampler which is a big pad it's 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 an inverse vacuum cleaner if you know what I mean and then this big pad is pushed down into the asteroid. It's supposed to, just when it makes contact, it's supposed to fire and pull in the sample. That thing sank half a meter deep into the target. And the strength inferred for the surface is in the one Pascal range or less. One Pascal, which is the weight of a leaf, force preunion area of a leaf sitting on your hand. In Earth's gravity, it's just nothing. Okay, so very weak. Ryugu, they did an experiment where <clears throat> they had um, actually an IED, exactly the same kind of thing as what's fired against a lot of our armies. <laughs> it, it, it's a shaped charge, it's explosively formed projectile, two kilograms, two kilometers per second into the target, made a crater, but the crater was much bigger than expected. And the modeling of that event also showed that the strength of Ryugu is at most in the one Pascal range. Unbelievable. So it's, um, 
gravity dominated, even though it's a small body. It's, it's incredible. The strength is so low that the gravity of a few hundred meter diameter body is enough to dominate the strength for the impact. So under those conditions, can the beta be that big? Yes, it can. So you create a lot of ejector. Now that ejector is very slow, but still it carries off a lot of momentum. Now, Nick asked if a strong target can also do that. The answer is yes. Strong target can also give you a high recoil because yes, it throws off a, lot, a much smaller quantity of material, but because it's strong, that material is thrown off at very high speed. And because it's thrown off at high speed, even though lower mass carries off a lot of momentum. So you can still get these high values of momentum transfer even if it's a small target, even if it's a hard, strong target. So it's very, very complicated. The uh, DART prediction paper said that beta could be anywhere from one to five or one to six even, because it could be strong, could be weak. Could be... <laughs> Certain things, oh, okay. So, so two, strength tends to make it lower if you have a material that has high friction, like basalt has high friction. Okay, so it makes tense if you break anyway it's a very complicated the, 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 there's there's a whole cottage industry lots and lots of papers so it's, it's a very good question um but i'm i'm going to use my prerogative to have you expand on another piece of uh, physics if you don't mind mm -hmm. uh, you showed the beautiful pictures of the tail mm -hmm. um and presumably that's um the combination of you know celestial mechanics and radiation pressure yeah. and launch velocities oh, that yes. andy and i are familiar with from back in the, the oh, yeah. Jupiter Io days. And I know there's an, an, an intense ground-based campaign. What, will that tie down these things about recoil velocities? Recoil velocities, no. I mean, they, they, there was an attempt to, okay, there have been calculations of the total amount of material that they're seeing. That's the most important thing. That's where the, the 10 to the seven kilogram number comes from. So you have to infer you have to look at the total brightness and then you have to say something what is the size distribution of the particles that you see so that's that's where the, a lot of the work is and what they do the dynamics of these particles if it, you know if they're small particles so less than a millimeter down to micron or submicron sizes even is initially there is you know affected by the system gravity but then the solar radiation pressure on these bodies is what that's what pushes them back into the tail so you have to model that those trajectory what the trajectories look like and then look at the brightness profile moving down the tail and then back out the size distribution of your particles and then from that look at the total amount of brightness and get a total mass and another cottage industry and a whole lot of uh, data analysis programs oh yes a lot of, <laughs> a whole lot of stuff yes so if you look in the nature, there's four nature papers. So one of them is on the Hubble observations. So a lot of this what I just talked about is in that paper. All right, let me uh, uh, follow through uh, to uh, invite student questions um, first. Um, and uh, please go ahead. So, oh, will the other one work? The one in your hand would be best. Okay. It's not on. So if we were to do this closer to Earth, would we have to worry about the ejecta hitting the Earth or knocking out satellites in orbit? It was quite close to Earth already. The direct impact was 0 0.07 AU from Earth. So it's, it's, it's um, but no, I don't think so. There, there, there is a paper you can look at, um, which actually calculated the probability of DART impact ejecta hitting Mars, that's, that's actually not that small. And then um, hitting Earth as well, which is very small. I don't know the number, but there's very little. So I don't think we would need to worry about that. Uh, if you can uh, see people raising hands, I will take them uh, the microphone. Over there. Me, you can go first. Hi, great talk. Um, I was wondering if you were able to detect the change in eccentricity of Dimorphos? Oh, uh, yes. Okay. Yes, it's a very complicated story. And the reason is, um, 
And the orbits actually are, these are non-Keplerian orbits. And the reason being that the orbit is very close compared to the size of the bodies. Um, I, let's see if I actually have it drawn to, well, you, you, can, you can see already how close the bodies are. <laughs> that's, a, that's a real image. So um, because of that, it's not Keplerian. And that means that even though observationally, the orbit looks circular or close to circular. And as you measure the distance between the bodies in the telescope, it's not, it looks like it's not changing. Okay, or, or you also have to be in the right geometry to do that, but you could. You, but then, in fact, because it's a non cliparian orbit, the oscillating elements are in fact eccentric. Okay, so the DART impact you can show in a Keplerian model, it changes the eccentricity by about 0.03. So if it was very low eccentricity before the impact, it's around 0.03 after. I mean, I showed the picture. The, the, the uh, apoapsis comes down. Right, so the point of impact becomes the new apoapsis, right? The new periapsis. Periapsis? Okay. Sorry, it's gotta be apoapsis. It's okay. gotta be the most distant location. That right, impact. yeah. Sorry, yeah, you're right. So it was like basically circular before? Yes, right. Okay. That's, yeah, right. because it's tidally relaxed system. We believe it was tidally relaxed. Yes, yeah, so that's the correct car cartoon. And, um, right. Okay, no, you're right. Yes. So that's the apoapsis up there, periapsis. Now, um, because it's not Keplerian, we, the orbit isn't going to be exactly circular. Right before okay so then it becomes very complicated exactly what happens what's the story eccentricity also um there's also an exchange of angular momentum between the rotation of dimorphos and the orbital angular momentum and the result is that the librations of dimorphos which are going to be excited by the dart impact the dart impact was not exactly in the center first of all. And secondly, because you changed the orbit period, whatever spin rate, if it was tidally locked before, it's the wrong spin rate after. Mm -hmm. And so there's got to be librations. And then the amplitude of the librations, may be un it may turn out that the librations are unstable and that the whole system is tumbling now. And if it's tumbling, then you got the angular momentum exchange between the rotation of the secondary and the orbit angular momentum the result is the eccentricity is not going to be constant. It's going to be, the orbit period is also going to be oscillating. Now, this oscillation period, I haven't mentioned it, but it's small compared to the change that the DART spacecraft induced, but it's not negligible. And it may already have been observed. So the DART, I, I didn't say, it was a 12 hour, 11.9 hour rotation period, I'm sorry, orbit period, 11.9 hours, we changed that, by 33 minutes. Wow. Okay. The effect of the angular momentum exchange I'm talking about is at the one minute level. Okay. It's, it's, it's maybe measured already. Changes in the eccentricity also may be measured already. This is stuff that these observers have, it's, it's, not, it's they're not all published yet, but will be soon. So yes, this is a huge interest industry also. It's measuring yeah, all these changes. See Anne Marie Madigan, Professor Madigan, writing things down curiously. She teaches solar system formation and dynamics, and I think she's writing her final exam. As you <laughs> <know>. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, yeah. So this is good. Good exam questions. We all learned a lot of dynamics from this. I had a question about the beta values. Are yeah. does the shape of the impactor influence beta? Of course, yes. <laughs> and like how strongly, like, does, do you think like, like does the large solar panels here really matter for this? Or like if you have like a cone asteroid deflector in the future, does that make a stronger, you know what I mean? Okay, there have been a lot of investigations of this. There's a couple of papers on exactly that topic, which have been published actually. And um, yes, it's, 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 it's not a huge effect. So we're talking 10, 20% kind of effect changes. But um, yes, the simulation people are very excited about this. And it turns out it's very hard to model a spacecraft. 
because it requires it puts huge demands on the resolution of your simulation and um, becomes extremely expensive and actually impractical to try to model these things. So um, a lot of the work that that I've talked about actually took the spacecraft and modeled it as three spheres. <laughs> <laughs> But then there's other people modeling it as a hollow cube with all kinds of different plates. You know, people have looked at a lot of different things. Um, and so the short answer is yes, there is an effect. It's not a huge effect. Okay, the spacecraft, you get a bigger effect if you tried to make it like a penetrator. I mean, an anti tank projectile doesn't look like this, right? There's a reason why they're long, skinny, very dense things, because that, that's how they can get in the deepest. They would have the highest beta. But we didn't do that. We have a spacecraft that's just sort of spread out and got lots of voids inside. So, all right. Interesting. Other uh, student questions I see up in the back. I'm bringing you the mic. So this was uh, obviously a unique uh, opportunity to get a camera very close to the surface of an asteroid. So was there anything learned uh, about you know, surface processes on, on the asteroid, for example? Surface processes on asteroids, yes. Or, or anything, I mean, I don't know much about asteroids, so I just said that. No, no, yes. Um, actually, I, I didn't talk about that at all, but yes, there are, there's a whole question of what happens, what does cratering look like on these bodies? And I, I, I talked about that a little bit. There's also a, a paper I haven't, I didn't talk about at all, but it's on Didymos, there are these long grooves that look like they could be the result of boulders rolling down a slope. So that, of course, tells you also the surface has to be very weak to let that happen. And um, you can ask yourself, well, what are, why would they do that? Well, it, it turned, well, anyway, so, so yes, yeah, so there's things like that. But we are learning about that, but I didn't have time to talk about it. <laughs> we'll open up for general questions. Including students. So the fact that the uh, that the tail has was observed for so many hundreds of days after the impact, mm -hmm. what does that tell us about what is still disturbed on the surface? Oh. Is it the tumbling, or was it something else that? Okay. Yes. Yeah, okay. I, I should I should have said it. But no. What happens is that there's a lot. We believe it's because there's a lot of low speed ejecta that is ejected fast enough to get away from the moon but not enough to get out of the dynamo system. So they're in temporary orbits. There's a, there's a disk probably formed, and then the material is escaping out of the disk to maintain a tail. So getting back to the more general question mm -hmm. um, of defense, what's the number of known asteroids in this 100 to 200 meter scale? Um, and, <laughs> and what fraction, and, and, and the, but the real question is, if you detect one, What's the most likely time that you have to deflect it if you think it's a danger? Okay, there, that, that number is in the million year frame. Oh. Yeah, on, on the average, the lifetime of, of the asteroids in the Nero system is a 10, million to 10 million years, so that kind of number. So if you have an object that has a probability of significantly less than one in a million, then it's a the guy that you should be paying attention to because he's more likely than average to hit, hit the Earth. You know, so the highest risk asteroids are ones where the impact probability is in the one in thousands or tens of thousands. So those are the ones that are, you know, one of the most, most dangerous. And he was asking about completeness of the surveys. Right. At that time. Yeah, at that size, completeness surveys. I don't know the number. Is it one, anybody, Alex, you may know. Is it, it's like half or not, not, not even 40%. 40%, yeah. Alex, by the way, is responsible. You should talk to him to, to, uh, about some of the dynamics questions that I, I was talking about, like the angular momentum exchange, this, this paper. Uh, and Alex, are you, um, uh, I infer you're in um, uh, uh, Dan Shear's group, or? Yes. Yeah. So more expertise outside of um, uh, College of Arts and Sciences, but in the uh, College of Engineering. Uh, so, Leisha Cube, the uh, CubeSat's now wandering the solar system by itself. Does it have any future no, observations no, it might it, make? It, it, it actually, <coughs> it has stopped operating. It actually stopped 
operating in the middle of data transmission. So it didn't quite get all of its data back to us. It just shut up. <laughs> and that was it. Don't know what happened. <laughs> Stop working. <laughs> well, that's what happens. So with the Hera mission in 2026, would we still have to navigate the debris field or a possible ring system that was created due to this impact? That's one of the things they're looking into. They don't know. I don't think. But yes, that's a good question. And they have to think about that. Uh, and Andy hopes to be a member of the uh, HERA team, I think. Yeah, yeah I do. We'll get him back yeah. then. So has the efficacy and, and just the high beta that we got for this one, also noting that we're finding that asteroids are weaker and you know more porous than we originally thought, has that lended, basically has it led us to believe that kinetic impact might be more useful on highly porous, highly weak bodies like comets, or are we still pretty much in the, it's really only nuclear devices territory? <laughs> That's a very good question. I don't even know the answer to that. The truth. Comets is, you know, the, the, it's a smaller fraction of the threat. The impact threat, maybe 1% is comets. So people tend not to worry about it. People tend to, if you haven't thought about it, maybe that's wrong. Maybe it's going to be a comet that comes get us. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, the highly porous targets are not so good, actually, for really, it's, it's really, really very porous and very weak. Yeah, you get, but um, you actually don't get ejected material at all. It just all just squishes, or you just fly through the guy. <laughs> No. <clears throat> From the ejecta photos that you showed, um, has there been a study that suggests there's two species of ejecta, a high, a high velocity species and low velocity, or is it more of a continuous distribution? I, I think it's a continuous distribution. I'm not sure exactly what the, there may have been a paper that talked about that. I don't, I don't remember. I don't think so. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I'll ask you the uh, the question from the congressional hearing. Oh. This, uh, uh, Dr. Cheng, uh, <clears throat> uh, if we're, there were to be an asteroid approaching the Earth on a collision course, mm -hmm. and we only had the DART spacecraft uh, to protect us, uh, how far away would we have need to uh, impact it well, to avoid the Earth? It depends on, on how big the target was, how big the asteroid was. Oh, it's same size asteroid. Oh. Uh, sorry, same size asteroid, how long beforehand? Okay, that's, this is a number I could, that, that's calculable. I don't happen to know the answer, but we're talking years, though. Multiple years? Yeah, multiple years. And that's, that's with, uh, you said millimeter uh, per second uh, delta V, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, I'm sure that Congress will fund uh, this so that you can have uh, uh, bigger impactors because uh, we may not get that. Yeah, uh, so, or, or more than one. <laughs> all right. Uh, uh, looks like we've answered all the questions. Oh, wait, was that a hand? All right. So, um, say you have like an object that's 10 times the size of Dimorphos. Um, would we be able to build a spacecraft that would have the same effect on the object? Probably not. Okay, no, the question was if, if it was 10 times the size. I'm not sure what you mean by 10 times the size. 10 times the mass, you can imagine maybe doing that something 10 times heavier. If it's 10 times the diameter, that's 1,000 times the mass, and I would say no. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think we've taken care of all the questions. Let's thank Andy again. Uh, uh, thanks for a great talk and for protecting us. Okay. Um, uh, and I think we have one more space at dinner. If anybody uh, wants to join us, please come on up now and I'll give you the details.